after the long run of Daniel Craig and the finale of his fifth film, No Time to Die, we the fans are left wondering what will happen next. Because Barbara Broccoli and Michael T. Wilson will have to go out and find a new bond and then we'll have to set out on a new course. Because now the bond is dead, we have to somehow revive him and bring him back. The only way to do that is to sort of neglect what uh, we saw in the uh, in the uh, finale of No Time to Die and act as if that didn't happen. I doubt Michael and Barbara will try to make another another reboot where we have to see Bond earn his 007 license once again because that was Casino Royale. I mean, we cannot do that. That was his first mission. We cannot do that over again. So now what? Well, I think the most obvious thing to do is to sort of acknowledge the events of the Fleming novels and sort of say, well, these things have happened. And there are some things that have happened over the course of the novels. Most of it uh, we've seen in the movies as well, in some form or another. Uh, and, and this has happened. But everything that have not happened in the novels, the new Bond would not need to acknowledge. Obviously, it would be hard to acknowledge uh, Bond's daughter and Bond's death and so forth because we sort of have to bring him back again. So the most obvious thing, in my opinion, is to say, okay, we've had the events of the Fleming novels, starting with Casino Royale, ending with The Man with the Golden Gun and the short story collection, The Property of a Lady, um, The Living Daylights and Octopussy. What happened next? What happened after this? There are some key events in the novels that I think should be acknowledged in, uh, in the next uh, Bond film. Maybe not mentioned, but at least acknowledged that this has happened. Like the loss of Vesper, the loss of Tracy in Honor Majesty's Secret Service, and also uh, the maiming of Felix Leiter in the novel Live and Let Die, which was an event that occurred in the uh, 1989 film License to Kill, which happens to be one of my favorite Bond films, and Timothy Dawson happens to be my favorite Bond. I think these things should be acknowledged, and if Felix Leiter shows up in the next Bond film, I think he should, you know, not have his arm and his uh, leg intact. I think he ought to be disabled uh, from his encounter with the uh, Great White Shark in License to Kill. I don't want to see Blofeld back. I don't think he worked well in neither Spectra nor No Time to Die. And uh, we only saw his cat briefly and it didn't even fit in at this uh, torture table machine thing Bond was strapped to in Spectra. Um, so I don't want to go there again. Uh, I think the series should move on. I would like to see some more uh, standalone films, and they don't need to be three hours long. That's not the same as saying we should go back to uh, a slightly more one-dimensional Bond, like what we saw with uh, Sean Connery and uh, Roger Moore in some way. I like to see, you know, the flawed Bond, the human Bond, the emotional Bond who makes mistakes. And that was something I really enjoyed with both Timothy Dawson and Daniel Craig. Um, I also think um, Pierce Brosnan had some of that too. I think he tried to, to keep Bond emotional uh, uh, from time to time and, uh, and uh, you know, balanced it well. He gave us a, a, a classic bond with some of the virtues that we have learned to love from Connery and Moore. But he also gave us something else. Maybe the fans don't uh, like the script for Brosnan's last outing all that much, but I think we have to acknowledge that it was, you know, a pretty huge step for the script writers back then to, you know, show. Bond with a full beard, uh, coming out of a uh, North Korean prison, being uh, exchanged at that bridge. You know, that, 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 was, that was a wild thing to do at that time before Casino Royale came out. And if that had not been successful, I think Casino Royale would, look, have, would have looked a little different. But there's a major difference between 
Daniel Craig and Timothy Dalton and their portrayals uh, of Bond. And I think it's that Dalton gave us a smarter Bond who tried to be ahead of his uh, villains. I like how he tricks the KGB in the living daylights into thinking that you know, Kara is in the telephone booth, even though she's not. And it's just a cello case dressed up in her clothes. I thought that was, you know, that was funny, but not in a silly way. You know, it's not like showing Bond in the uh, in a clown costume. It's 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 smart humor in my book. But also in License to Kill, we see uh, Bond trick Sanchez into uh, believing that uh, Milton Crest um, have tried to trick uh, Sanchez. They were afraid I'd warn you, spoil their plans. Gracias. Those men tried to kill me. Who would do such a thing? Someone close to you. They were well briefed, obviously by someone on the inside. And thus we see uh, Sanchez uh, kill off Chris in this famous uh, compression chamber scene. And, and I think there are some smart moves uh, on Bond's part in, in these two films that I think are missing in, um, in Daniel Craig's films. I think Daniel Craig is a very physical Bond, and I like that. And I, you know, I, I like the mistakes he makes from time to time. But he also takes some chances that are far out. I think, for instance, when he takes on an entire army of African soldiers when he tries to get into this embassy in Casino Royale, that scene never really worked for me. You know, Bond taking on. A, <laughs> Uh, uh, you know, armed soldiers with his bare hands getting away with it. You know, I'm much more into you know a, a Golden Eye like um, direction here. You know, with Bond just gunning down the Russian soldiers from a distance. Yeah, but that that seemed much more plausible in my book. And I think Golden Eye should be a go-to film. Golden Eye and The Living Daylights. These two movies, I think, should be the go-to movies because these movies are serious enough to be taken seriously, even though, especially Goldeneye, do have some does have some silly stuff, but they're sinister and dark enough to be taken seriously. But they do have, you know, a minimum of humor that the audiences have come to expect. She always did enjoy a good squeeze. So something in between those two and the darkness of uh, and the um, uh, unpredictability of Casino Royale. That's what I would like to see. You know, I don't, I don't mind the open endings, but you know, it's, it's, it's not a surprise each and every time. If Bond never runs off with the girl at the end, it's, it's not a surprise. And just because we've seen Q and Moneypenny, I mean, that doesn't um, mean they should be there all the time. I mean, Casino Royale and Quantum of Solace uh, pretty much showed that they need not be forced into the story. We don't need Q to see Q each and every time. Uh, and and uh, we don't need to see uh, Moneypenny either each and every time. I think we've gotten a, a very good M with Ralph Fiennes. Um, I enjoy Judy Dench, but I also enjoy Ralph Fiennes and I guess he's going to continue being M in the next Bond film, uh, no matter who they cast as uh, Bond. But as I said, uh, I would like to see movies more of akin to Golden and the Living Daylights, where the action matters. The action is intense. I want to see Bond sweat. I want to see Bond, you know, uh, jeopardize his life. I want to see him uh, get wounded, get shot, even get tortured. Um, we gotta acknowledge Daniel Craig wasn't the first Bond to show this. Pierce Brosnan was back in uh, The World Is Not Enough. Um, but, you know, I, I want to see Bond 
uh, get hurt and there has to be something at stake for him. I don't want to see Bond go back to, you know, being on top of his game, even when he's being shot at. I mean, he has to show fear. He has to show anger. He has to show emotion. But I think the struggle for Bond should be within. I don't think he should struggle with, you know, losing friends and girlfriends and... Uh, I mean, I, th I think we've seen that Bond losing Vesper, Bond losing Amp, Bond losing Rene Mathis, Bond losing Felix, um, eventually losing himself. I mean, to some extent, at, at some point it becomes tiring because now we've seen it. So move on. I hope to see some more complicated plots. That was something I particularly loved about movies such as uh, For Your Eyes Only, The Living Daylights, The World Isn't Enough. And also Quantum of Solace. I know it's uh, it's almost blasphemy to say anything good about the plot for Quantum of Solace, but I quite enjoyed it. I get why some people dislike the editing of Quantum of Solace, but the plot overall was, you know, quite smart. I really think Robert Wade and Neil Purvis nailed it by when they put Bond into this rather realistic situation where this private firm is trying to destabilize a South American country to gain access to its water supplies. Because that's quite realistic, actually. And the fact that this could actually happen, I think that's pretty scary. And, and that is what makes Quantum of Solace a good movie to me. The difference is my country is not some fly speck in the middle of the Caribbean. But we've already begun destabilizing the government. We'll supply the private security. We'll pay off the right officials. And we have 26 countries ready to officially recognize your new Bolivian government. You want your country back. My organization can give it to you within a week. You've been busy. And in return, you want what? A desert. This part. This land is worthless. Oh. So you're getting a great deal. You won't find oil there. Everyone has tried. Maybe. Maybe not. But we own whatever we find. Much more interesting, actually, than the next three Craig outings. I, I must say, and um, maybe I'm in the minority here, but because of the plot and the uh, these plausible villains, I, I like Quantum of Solace better than Skyfall and particularly Spectra and No Time to Die. So a smarter Bond, still a flawed human being, but first of all, a veteran Bond, maybe fed up. That's the impression we get with Timothy Dalton. That, that this is a Bond who's fed up with, with what he's doing. Uh, but I think that makes him interesting. All the heroes I know are dead. Talia, listen to me. How can you act like this? How can you be so cold? It's what keeps me alive. No. It's what keeps you alone. Rather than having another rookie Bond like Daniel Craig was in his first two outings, because we've sort of seen that now, so the series has to go somewhere else, I think. And lastly, what I would like for the uh, next uh, film is to have some better music. I don't want to go into anything, uh, any discussion here about the songs, the quality of the songs. I liked Billie Eilish's song. I like Sam Smith's song. I liked Adele. I was less fond about Another Way to Die, and obviously I loved You Know, um, uh, you know My Name. I was fond of Golden, I was fond of Surrender, I was fond of The World Is Not Enough, The Living Daylights, Lives Is To Kill, A View To Kill, and so forth. I also like Diamonds of Goldfinger. It's not the songs, it's the scores. And I think there's been a huge decline in the musical quality of the Bond films ever since David Arnold left the show. I mean, he, he went out on a high with a brilliant, brilliant score for Quantum of Solace. Um, that really made up for the song, uh, the shortcomings of the song, but the soundtrack as a whole is fantastic. Skyfall, not so much. Spectra, even less so. And No Time to Die has, you know, a few 
few places where there's some i mean i like that staccato versions of the bond theme that plays when um when uh, bond tried to get a to uh, to get away from the square in the pre-title sequence uh, it's been used uh, one or two times more later on in the film um, i like the track home you know when bond uh, sees matilda for the first time uh, and, and the references to on a matches to see her service I, I don't think i don't know why they are there but they sound good but the majority of the soundtrack i think is noisy uh, non-melodic uh, no noise with rhythm and it would be nice to see the bond noise move away from that and back to melody um, maybe just to, to hear david arnold back for the debut of the next bond film that would be nice i don't doubt that the next bond film is going to be good because whenever a new bond comes along his first film is often good. I mean, many people still see Live in the Bias. Maybe not Roger Moore's best film, but at least one of them. I mean, up there with For Your Eyes Only and The Spy Who Loved Me. Uh, Dr. No uh, often ranks high. Uh, for Connery fans, uh, The Living Daylights often ranks high. Uh, many fans seem, seem to like it better than License to Kill. I don't get that, but I... I, in a way, I get it because it's a more classic approach, uh, and it has everything you want from a Bond film. Where *License to Kill* is a more, um, it's a, it's a different, it's much more different. And most people, even even the people who dislike Brosnan as Bond, they tend to like *Goldeneye*. Um, and many people would also agree that *Casino Royale* remains to be Craig's best Bond outing. So. I don't doubt that the next Bond film will be good. What happens after that is probably gonna gonna be a more divisive topic for fans uh, because that's usually how it is. But um, these are my hopes for the next Bond film. <laughs> <laughs> 